We started a series this last week we just simply titled Rebel or Rebels. The title of this message is Holiness is the Rebellion. And I'm going to interchange the word holiness and purity because I think for some folks, the word purity will make more sense. Holiness seems like we got to be hyper-spiritual and something different than we are. What it simply means, if I could just break it down to the smallest of uh, nutshells, if you would, it's just simply doing it God's way. And when you do it God's way, there's an, a natural antagonist to the world because the world disagrees with God's way. And so it's a natural uh, we're, we're naturally rebellious if, uh, to the culture, to the world, and its philosophies. But today we're going to start out and look at 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 13 through 16. We, we ended up at verse 12 last week. But I want to read this, and then I'm going to read it from a paraphrased version of it, so it maybe makes a little bit more sense. But so prepare your minds for action and exercise self-control. Put all your hope in the gracious salvation that will come to you when Jesus Christ is revealed to the world. So you must live as God's obedient children. Don't slip back into your old ways of living to satisfy your own desires. You didn't know any better then, but now you must be holy in everything you do, just as God who chose you is holy. For the scriptures say, you must be holy because I am holy. Folks, when we read the Bible, I think it's important that we realize that these apostles, the disciples, were just like us. They didn't have superpowers or extra, they weren't extra gifted by God to live the way that God wanted them to live. They were just regular, ordinary folks that chose to serve Jesus, serve God. But if you make them superheroes, or having this super giftedness or something special from God, then what does that leave us? And too many of us read the Bible that way, like these guys were some. These guys were just like us. In fact, Peter, at one point, cussed at a, at a little girl that just said simply, aren't you one of his followers? And he said, no, I'm blankety blanking. No, I don't know him. These guys didn't have superpowers. They have the same power that we have to live for Christ. And he's called the Holy Spirit. And, and so, and we have the Word of God. And so, we can't, we just, we just need to understand they were just regular people. Peter was a regular guy, just like all of us. But the words he wrote are as relevant today as they were back then. So, these words I just read, they're as relevant today as they were back then. He's talking to us about living a life of purity, holiness, or sanctity. And a lot of times you hear holiness, sanctification, but I'm breaking down because the word we'll use here is pure or purity or authentic, and, and we do it God's way, we naturally live that way. The paraphrased version of 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 13 through 16, just a paraphrase. So roll up your sleeves. Put your mind in gear. Be totally ready to receive the gift that's coming when Jesus arrives. Don't lazily slip back into those old grooves of evil, doing just what you feel like doing. You didn't know any better then, you do now. As obedient children, let yourselves be pulled into a way of life shaped by God's life, a life energetic and blazing with purity or holiness. God said, I am holy, you be holy. And so Peter's saying we got to get some things right. We got to get some things in gear. We got to we can't slip back because when people walk away from God, they almost never go back to something new. They always go back to something old. You go back to your old ways. They were your ways, then you got born again and you developed new ways, but when you walk away from the new ways, you automatically pick up the old ways. That's why some of you start backsliding and say, "Man, I haven't had this desire in years, but now it's starting to work you." Now you know you got to get back. You got to say, what do I got to do? I got to get right with God. I need, to, I need to begin to serve him the way I know to serve him. What am I doing? When you become frustrated, that's, that's when you know you're doing it on your own strength. When you become complacent, that's when you know that you're not doing something that God wants you to do because you're grieving somewhere the Holy Spirit. And so we just have to figure that out and keep, you know, do what we know to do. 
It's not rocket science, it's not that hard. Now living pure in this world, it's a bit like swimming upstream. Our society, our culture, it seems to push us the other way towards its own ideas or ideals of what's right or what's okay and what's wrong. Everywhere you turn, there's this push to do what feels good, what's easiest, not necessarily what's right. And if you give someone the easy way out, they usually take it, but a lot of times that's not the best way. But here's the kicker from 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 13 through 16, living pure, living right, it's the real act of rebellion in this world. It's a clear signal that we're not just going along with the crowd. It's a loud and proud statement that we're living according to God's standards, not the world's. The God we follow, the God of Israel, he's pure, and he wants us to reflect that purity in every aspect of our lives. And later on in this message, towards the end, I'm gonna give us eight things that also are including in holiness, because for most of us, when we think of holiness or purity, we think of only morality. But that's one part of the whole thing. Because you can live been living moral, but what if you're a liar? What if you have a bad attitude? What if you walk in unforgiveness? See, holiness or being pure before God is simply doing it his way. And when you do that, it's a, it's, it naturally goes against the world's ways. And if it doesn't in your life, then you're not really doing what God says. Peter begins to tell us in this scripture of, that he's telling us to have our minds in gear, to be alert. It's easy to get swept up in what everyone else is doing or thinking, but we've gotta stay switched on, aware of the pitfalls and traps that might pull us off track. You and I have to understand that's what Peter's saying. We have to be alert. Next, he talks about not falling back into our own old ways. In our journey to live a life of purity, we've got to resist those old temptations, the old habits that used to drag us down. It's not always going to be easy, but we've got to stand strong and keep our focus on God because you are gonna be pulled at times. You are gonna be in a place where it's tempting. You are gonna get in a situation where, man, I thought I was delivered from that, but here's the temptation. And we've got to exercise what the Bible says, self-control. Because whatever your issues were before you got saved, you're working through them to overcome them when you got saved, but when you walk away from that, those old things become to rise up. So either God is lifted up in your life or the old ways are lifted up. The higher you lift God in your life, put him first, do what he says, the less these things tempt you. So if you're starting to teeter like, man, these things are starting to come, all you gotta do is do a checkup from the neck up. <laughs> God, what is it? What is it I, I need to do? Or what more must I do? And, and then it'll come to you, you'll know, like, I know, I quit doing that, I need to start doing that, I quit doing this, I need to start doing that. And so we, that's how it works. So if old temptations are lurking at your door, knocking on your heart and mind, you know, hey, God, I, I repent, I, but I, gotta, I, I know I need to do this, or I need to get back doing that, or I need to start doing putting you first. Because the higher we exalt God in our lives, the lower those things become in our lives. The old self. How many of y'all know your old self? Because when we testify, we're like, I used to be like this, but now I'm like this. Well, if you don't wanna be what you used to be, then keep doing what you're supposed to do. That's holiness, that's purity. Then comes the big command from himself. He says, I am holy, you be holy. It's not a suggestion. That's God laying down the law, the smackdown, if you would. He wants us all to live according to his ways, his standards, his commands. This has to seep into every part or aspect of our lives, the way we talk, the way we act, the way we treat others, and the way we think. Now living pure, living the way God's word teaches will ruffle feathers at times of people. The world pushes one thing, God says something different. Living for God will not always be popular, especially in today's climate. 
That's why they mock the church. They attack the church. They're always showing on TV shows, if you ever watch them, they always show Christians in the weirdest way, way possible. And that, they're just trying to mock it so you won't become one. That's the devil. That's not God. And we're not whacked out like that. Well, some of us aren't. And last week, if you weren't here and you heard that there was an incident, some lady got up and then she flipped us off when she got around that corner and I said, not here, uh-uh, no. And then she went in the parking lot, kept cussing, screaming. I've been coming here since it was Victory Love. One of our security guys, it was funny, said, well, obviously you haven't learned much. But we're not going to tolerate it. This is a safe place. And it's going to stay that way. People get mad, that's okay, but you're not going to act up and act out. So I wasn't being mean. I was just saying, oh, no, we're not going to let the devil get away with anything. That's the, that's the devil just messing. But you know what he got? He got shot down quick. It's like, you know what? Not here. Yep, not in this house. But anyway, so... But God, you know what? And then about 25 or 30 people made decisions for Christ right after that. God can, he can show up and do anything if you choose to believe him. And so the world pushes. But we gotta, we gotta just hold fast, hold tight. But know this, standing up for what is right, going against the grain, that is the mark of a true rebel. And the reward for that is not something that's going to fade away. We're talking about a reward that is literally out of this world. God says when you come up to heaven, and we, we will, we'll sit at a different seat because we're born again, and he begins to assess all the works you've done. He said some will be burned up with wood, hay, and stubble, but what's done for Christ will last forever, and he'll pass out rewards. I don't know what the rewards are gonna be, but they gotta be great. If the streets are gold, I can't imagine what kind of, and I don't know what they are. Some people always say, I just want God to say, well done, that good and faithful servant. I always laugh, because I always think, I just want God to say, you can come in. <laughs> I mean, really, I just, I just wanna be allowed in. If he says the other one, icing on the cake, but if he just says, you, you made it, that's enough for me. Even if I was standing in line, you got tons of rewards in the I walked up and he says, ha, oh, dude, you get to stay, but you got no rewards. I'd be happy. And he said, I know I said there was mansions, but for you there's a shack. I'd rather have a shack in heaven than a mansion in hell. And folks, we're not gonna, we're not gonna be perfect. You're not gonna always do everything right. So even repentance is part of purity or holiness that we recognize who's the forgiver, that he can forgive anything. And so you and I need to understand that just, just walking with God goes against the whole world system today. And you know what's amazing to me? The world doesn't care if they offend you and I. They live blatantly, boldly. They promote things that are incredible. I just, I just shake my head at. And they never once say, I wonder if we offended the Christians. So let me help you, Christian. You need to start saying, and start, stop saying, well, I don't wanna do this because I don't wanna offend the world. There is, we need to be bolder than they are because we serve the only true God. And, and, and it, the Christian world got caught up in this thing that I think is a doctrine of a demon that, well, I don't wanna be offensive, I don't wanna offend. You know, isn't it funny, the world doesn't care if they offend us. They don't care if they offend our children. They don't care. And folks, we have to be who God called us to be and let him deal with everything else. And if someone gets offended because you say, I don't agree, that's your prerogative. And then you tell them, well, I don't agree because I believe in God and God says something's wrong or right and that's it. But today, against the word of God, the word of God is so incredible. When the prophet said in those days, he said, woe to those folks who call good evil and evil good. So they're calling us evil and everything else they're doing is good. That's the world, that's the devil. He comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But God has come to give you life and more abundantly. My hope would be that you choose life. You'll never be perfect. Anybody in here make a mistake? If you didn't raise your hand, 
you just did. <laughs> Anybody here never lied? If you didn't raise your hand, you just did. <laughs> We've all made mistakes. We've all come up short. And God still encourages us to live according to his ways. Living pure in a world that often seems anything but. It's more than just going against the flow. It's a clear declaration that we're on God's team and that we're committed to his playbook. And folks, you'd rather be on the winning team than the losing team. And it will be tough at times, we know that. But if we endure until the end, it will be worth it. Jesus says in Matthew 24, 13, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. What's he saying? Folks, we all say we're saved, but we don't receive our salvation until we die or till Jesus comes back. That's when salvation happens. What happens before that? Lordship. And if you make him Lord, then he said you'll be saved. You don't get saved and then decide some other time that he, who he is in your life. He becomes the boss, if you would, and we become the follower. That's lordship. And then he said, you'll be saved. But what Peter was talking about, until, it, until you receive that, salvation is when we die or he comes back, then we receive the salvation. But he says, in order to do that, you have to endure. What's he saying to us? It's gonna be hard, it's gonna be tough. You're gonna have problems. You're gonna struggle through some things and you're gonna overcome some things. You're gonna have good times and tough times. And we have good times. Hopefully you have good times. Hopefully you laugh some. But there's gonna be difficult times. I don't have to endure the good times. We went on vacation, I, I went to Cancun for a few days. I didn't have to endure Cancun. <laughs> I laid on a beach, got in the ocean with my arms up. You say, why are you getting, and they, do you think I'm kidding? Because bull sharks take your arm. <laughs> and I'm not gonna walk around with no arm. Well, they said he'll just grab you. Well, they said I'll die, but I'll die with everything. <laughs> Think I'm kidding. I told my wife, get your hands up. You don't know when they're coming. <laughs> and the average shark attacks in three feet of water. People say, well, you, you're better off going deep. The problem is if they come, you can't outswim them. You think I'm kidding. I'm a shark week expert. <laughs> I used to watch it right before we'd go on vacation, and my wife would say, you're so stupid. And then I'd sit with our friends and I'd say, now you guys know this and that. And they're like, why are we talking about sharks? Because they're in there and they can eat you. But I didn't have to endure that. Now there's things that we have to endure that are not so much fun. But we endure them because we know it's worth it. And we want to be, how many of y'all want your salvation? I got it. No, you don't. We don't, we don't get it till we get to heaven. <laughs> Did you make a mistake? Yes, sir. Okay, that's okay. I make a lot of them. Me too. Mine are just real public. <laughs> and so God calls, he calls us to holiness, purity. But this goes beyond just morality. It involves every aspect of our lives and encourages a total transformation that aligns us with the character and will of God. Here are several areas in which God calls us to live holy and pure that a lot of us may not even think of because we really don't understand what holiness and purity and sanctity is. Number one, your thoughts. The Bible teaches us to keep our thoughts pure and focused on things that are good, noble, and true. Listen to Philippians 4, 8. And now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. So if you wanna walk in purity, you gotta, we gotta begin to deal with our thought life. We have to. And then Romans 12, 2, I don't know if they even have that up there. I didn't use it last time. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. 
then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. Wow. So you have to give him your thought life. Number two is speech. Our words should reflect our commitment to God's ways. We are called to speak truth, to avoid harmful or hurtful language, and to use our words to build up and encourage others. Listen to Philippi, uh, Ephesians 4, 29. Don't use foul or abusive language. Let everything you say be good and helpful so that your words will be an encouragement to those who hear them. Now, I know we can use different adjectives for different things. We're talking about abusing somebody. We're talking about when you go after somebody, when you demean somebody, when you accuse somebody. And folks, let me help you as a Christian, because Christians, I think, are worse as this than a lot of people. There's accusations made all the time. We accuse people. We, you accuse your friends or people. You, you did this, and you accuse them, and you don't ask them. But the way God did it, he asked questions. The devil is the accuser of the brethren. But God always asks questions. When Cain and Abel, when Cain killed Abel, God came to Cain and said, hey, where's your brother? And what did he say? He smarted off to God. He said, I'm not, who am I? I'm not my brother's keeper. He said, come on, Cain. His blood's crying out from the ground. Did you know you killed him? How about Adam? Adam's in the garden. God says, where are you? You, you, you don't think God knew where he was? You don't think God knew everything he did? But what's the first thing he says is, Adam, how do you know you were naked? Did you? Did you eat of the tree I told you not to? Do you, do you not think God already knew he did? What's he trying to get us to do? For some of you that are more Texas, Oklahoma, you need to fess up. For some of you that are more intellectual, you need to confess your sins, my dear brothers and sisters of the faith. But for the rest of us, you gotta fess up. We just have to tell him. But I watch Christians accuse people and say, wait a minute, wait a minute, you didn't even ask him. You just, you just assume or you, you think you know something, but why don't you ask? Because that's how God operates. He never comes to condemn you either. And we gotta watch what we say to people. We gotta be an encouragement to them. Why not? Why not be a blessing to people? Why use your words to hurt and destroy? And then you wonder why people use their words to hurt and destroy you. The person that has friends are friendly. And so we speak good, and then if you have issues, you, you ask questions. I may know my staff will do some things when I get in my room, I said, you do this? I always ask. A lot of times I say, yeah. And if they're repentant, we just kind of deal with it and move on. If they're not, we deal with it a different way. But you gotta be careful making accusations because they can destroy people. And when you have having issues with folks, sit down with them if you need to and ask questions. Start asking, hey, did you say this? I heard you said this. Did you say this? Instead of saying, I know you said it because a lot of times what we've been told someone says, they didn't say at all or they said it in a whole different context. And a lot of times if you just ask questions, you can clear things up without having a big old ordeal or fight or hate each other for a while. Family members the same way. Ask questions. Use your words to encourage. Third one is actions. Holiness also extends to our behavior and actions. We are called to live justly, love, mercy, and walk humbly with God. Look at Micah 6, 8. Know, O oh people, the Lord has told you what is good, and this is what he requires of you, to do what is right, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. And so this includes how we treat others, how we work, how we care for the needy, and those who are hurting. Number four is relationships. The Bible also instructs us to conduct our relationships with love, respect, and integrity, whether that's within families, friendships, or our intimate life. We are to treat people with kindness and respect, giving people the benefit of the doubt. 
Number five, attitudes. We are encouraged to adopt attitudes that reflect God's character. This includes humility, patience, forgiveness, compassion, and kindness. Look at Colossians chapter three, verses 12 through 14. Since God chose you, the only way you come into the kingdom if God chooses you and he chose you, that's why you're here. Since God chose you to be the holy people he loves, you must clothe yourselves with tender-hearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Make allowance, this is a big one, make allowance for each other's faults. How many of y'all have faults? Yeah, and if you didn't raise your hand, you have a fault. How many of y'all appreciate when some people excuse your faults? How many have been married like over 20 years? Come on, somebody, okay. Now, if you've been married, I think, 20 years or longer, you, here's what we realize. There's just some things in that person, your husband or wife, that's not gonna change. I mean, we work to change it for 20 years and then we give up, but like, not gonna happen. Some things will change, but there's some things about our personalities that are not gonna change. And I think when you get to that place, you're happier with your spouse. That's just the way she thinks, that's the way he acts. And you either can fight about it all the time or just say, that is what it is. And then you're more peaceful. Now, if younger couples could figure that out, they'd be much happier. Well, you know, because, you know, it's funny how men marry. marry. Men marry women thinking they're never going to change. And women marry men thinking they can change them. <laughs> and they're both deceived. Because when you get married and you have a wife and all of a sudden you, get, you decide to have a family, you have a baby, everything changes. And she gives that baby a lot of attention. You used to be the baby, but now you're supposed to be the man. <laughs> they change, they're, they're, how they think changes. How they process the, you know, they, they, ha, they can't just go off. We got schedules, we got a baby. They're gonna change. They're gonna grow up and women, you can't change anybody if God can't. Now you do have superpowers, no doubt. And those can lend a help to men changing like, baby, okay, I'll change. I'm gonna use my superpower on you. But there are just some things that are not gonna change. And you can't keep fighting that. You're just, you're, you're fighting a battle you can't win. So my wife and I, we, you know, people don't realize Cynthia is sarcastic in a fun way. She's mouthy. She's not this quiet, meek, little mousy girl. <laughs> She's very independent. Sometimes if I'm gone a lot, I'll come home and she'll look at me and she said, you know you're messing up my life. <laughs> I know, but I do it with joy. <laughs> That's one thing you're not going to change. But we're just independent people, both of us. But she, she, her and I, we realize there's just some things about us that's gonna be the same forever. So we just, we abide at each other and then we don't, we don't even apologize, we just go on in life and the next thing you know, we're laughing. And I have to do a lot of that because she acts up a lot. <laughs> I'm kidding you. She was watching first service so I know I'm safe in this one. But we have to, our attitudes have to be pure. That's part of holiness. Worship, number six, our commitment to worshiping God and is another aspect of holiness, purity in all types of worship. Not just, not just giving money we, or singing. We worship God with our giving. We worship God with our words. We worship God with our, 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 you know, our lifestyle, our actions. So you gotta worship God. That, that's part of sanctity or purity or holiness. Number seven is stewardship. We're called to be good stewards of the resources God has given us. This includes our time, our talents, and our finances. In the church world, you hear a lot about stewardship of finances, but what about your time? Are you stewarding your talents properly? Are you giving God what's God's? Because I said, that, and I, I make it very clear, the only thing that lasts is the thing done for Christ. You might go to God and say, I built a business. He said, that's okay, it wasn't my business, you never gave it to me. So 
Glad you built it. How do I know if I give it to him? Do you put him first? Do you tithe off of it? Then it's your business. So you're not gonna get, no, I built a business. He's gonna say, what did you do for the kingdom? What did you do for my cause? Those are the things that'll last forever. Some of those folks out there serving, when we get to heaven, they might get more blessing and more rewards than I will, but they will thank me for saying, thank you for never giving up on causing me to serve. Because of that, I have rewards in heaven. Wow, what a, what a concept. And so we have to be stewards of everything we have. You know, Eddie Aragon, he's putting us on his radio station. We play at 7 o'clock, right? And uh, what, what, what is the call letters? I know a lot of people watch it. Kiva, 1600. Kiva 1600. 1600. So he's put my son on there. He puts us on there. He puts the services. He just wants people to know that God is real. And, and he has a whole audience. He has a whole audience that may never darken these halls, but they may listen enough to get born again, and then they'll come in as their new person. Stewarding, what talents and gifts, not just your money, but your time, and how, number eight, the last one, our bodies are described as temples of the Holy Spirit. First Corinthians chapter six, verses 19 and 20. Don't you realize that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and was given to you by God? You do not belong to yourself. For God brought you, bought you with a high price, so you must honor God with your body. We gotta take care of them. You say, well, I don't like working out. Well, you know, I've been told that after you eat a meal, go walk for 20 minutes. They said, that's great exercise. But at least it keeps your body moving. I, I, I saw a heart doctor years ago, and he said to me, he said, you know, your body's our bodies were not designed to be sedentary. And too many of us, we sit on our blessed assurances way too much, <laughs> and, we, and we don't act, we don't, we don't use our body for the kingdom. And, and you, you need to understand that, and you gotta take care of it. It's yours to take care of, we gotta steward that. That's part of holiness, that's part of living pure, that's part of living a genuine Christian life. Not a perfect Christian life, because everyone will sin and make mistakes. Every one of us will do that. And God is so big and so vast that he knew everything you would do right and everything you would do wrong long before the earth was here. He knew it before the foundations of the earth were ever laid, before you were ever thought of thousands of years ago. Not millions, but for God, he's infinite. I, I don't know how, I mean, he's God. He created everything. But even though he knew everything you would do, good, bad, wrong, right, evil, he still said, I want you in my family. We make God too small. Well, I don't know if God can forgive me for that. Are you kidding? He already has. Yeah, but you know, I did something real bad. Yeah, so what? He knew you were going to do it, and he still chose you. He knows everything and still chooses you every day. The question is, will we choose him every day? And when you blow it and you fall, you get right back up. You repent because that's part of walking with God and then you go forward in your life and keep serving him that's, that's how it works again it's not rocket science thank God because I would never get it it's the simplicity of the gospel that can help us all so live God's way and be in rebellion to this world and receive his rewards. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you for being here. Thank you for teaching us. I thank you for helping us all. I thank you for all those that are watching from wherever they're watching from, all of our campuses, online, all across the country and the world. God, may you bless them. May you show up where they're at right now because there's no time and space for you. You're everywhere. You're all knowing. You're all potent. You're all powerful. God, you're everywhere at the same time. So bless all those who hear your word. May we have ears to hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying. 
and bless each one. If you're sitting in here, you're online, and with every head bowed just for a moment, you say, Preacher, would you include me in your prayer? I've walked with God, but I've walked away. And you're right, I need to live more pure. Doesn't mean you're always going to get there. It just means you keep striving, you don't quit. So if that's you, I want to pray for you. I want to help you come home. That your relationship with God would be intact. Be restored. For some of you in here, you've never given Jesus your life. You may have prayed a prayer here and there, but you've never purposed to follow him. People want fire insurance or hell insurance. They want to be saved. But salvation happens when Jesus comes back. What happens now is we're born again, that God lives in us. Now the only question is, will you follow him? Yeah, but Pastor, I made a lot of mistakes. That's okay. You'll probably make a lot more, but he still chooses you. But are you willing to work through those and just keep saying yes? If that's you and you really want to give Jesus your life today, say, okay, man, I'm tired of fighting this. I'm going to give him my life, give him my heart, and say, God, you lead me, and I'm, I'm willing to learn. That's all he's asking. If that's you right where you're seated all over this place, I'm going to ask you to do one simple thing. It's so profound, but it's so simple. And you can miss it if you're, if you're not careful. Jesus says if we confess him before man, he'll confess us before our Father in heaven. This is a form of that. So are you ready? If you say, preacher, include me in your prayer right where you're seated. I'm going to pray with you right at your seat. I'm ready. In Jesus' name. Are you ready? Would you please just lift your hand all over this place? If you say, it's me. God bless you. 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 God bless you over here. Thank you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Who else is like, God bless you. God bless you. God bless you guys back there. God bless you. At the top, who else? God bless you. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. God bless you. God bless you. I see your hand way up the top. God bless you over here. I see your hand. Anybody else before we close? See, this is how God moves. You have to choose him. Animals live by instinct. All of them, we live by choice. God gave you and I the ability to choose his, thank you, God bless you, his highest and best creation. Choose him. Choose life today. Choose God's ways. and See what he does with your life. Anybody else before we close? Thank you. God bless you. I see your hand. God bless you. God bless you. Thank you so much. I'm going to look across the bottom section one more time. We're all going to pray together, guys. If this is your moment. Just say, I don't care what anybody thinks. God, I just want you in my world. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you, Josh. Father, in Jesus' name, so many hands were raised in this place today. And I'm asking you to be with them, to show yourself strong in their behalf. That they would know you and know your ways, God, that from this moment on, They'll be more attentive to who you are and what you say. When they read the Bible, they'll, they'll begin to understand it because the Holy Spirit will teach them. And they'll know they're yours. And when they make a mistake, God, they'll feel bad. And the only reason they feel bad is because you live in them. And may it be a reminder that I am God's son. I'm his daughter. I'm part of his family. And help us, Father, just to live your way and give people hope that see it. There's a God in heaven, and he's real, and he wants them in his family also. Bless them in Jesus' name. If you lifted your hand, I want you to pray this prayer loud with me right where you're seated. I want you to pray loud enough for your ears to hear your voice. And if you're right with God, I want you to pray it with us in support of them. And if you didn't raise your hand, but you should have, folks, I'm gonna lead you to Christ. Would you pray with us? Would you pray, Father, I choose to believe in Jesus. And I believe he's your son. And I believe he's Lord of all. So according to your word, I believe that in my heart. And now I willingly confess with my mouth, Jesus, be Lord of my life. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for forgiving me. In Jesus' name, amen and amen and amen.